What follows is an interview with John St. George Cray regarding his experiences as a first lieutenant, Company B, 85th Mountain Regiment, 10th Mountain Division in World War II. John was born April the 14th, 1921, and died at age 90 on June the 28th, 2011. This interview was conducted in 2004 at his home in Santa Rosa, California. Okay, just for the record, this is uh, February, no, sorry, April the 17th, 2004. Uh, we're interviewing John S. Cray, uh, First Lieutenant, Company B, 85th Regiment, 10th Mountain Division during World War II. Yes. When were you born? What was your date? April 14th, 1921. 1921. Okay. All right. Well, uh, we're going to confine our comments today to the World War II type experiences. Uh, you started college in 1939. Yes. Um, what was the atmosphere at the college? Did you have? Did you feel like there was war coming? What What was the overall atmosphere? Well, actually, we were all pretty unconscious. But when it really came home was December the 7th, 1941, when the Japanese hit Pearl Harbor. And I can remember exactly where I was. I was walking down the corridor in the fraternity house and somebody had their radio on, I, I heard it. And I can even remember the clothes I was wearing. And that was the days, uh, that, those were the days when even college students wore hats. <laughs> I had on a, a felt hat. That, those memories that you never forget. Okay. Um, how did things change around campus after that? Well, every, the, the next day, which was a Monday, Virtually the whole fraternity went down to Denver to various reenlistment things, whether if they thought they wanted to be in the Navy or the Marines or the Air Force or the Army, and tried to enlist, and a lot did. But most of us that did enlist went in, into the, the E-7 or one of those other things, which they wanted us to finish school so they'd have a a large pool from which to draw officers. Is that what you did? Yeah. E7. How did you enlist for that? What was the... Well, I, I went down, and I'll make it brief. First, I, I tried to join the Marines, and they said, well, your eyesight isn't good enough. I waited six weeks, and I went back and tried again, and this time I got through the eye exam, but they said, oh, you have a varicose vein in your leg, you'll never be able to do all the marching you have to do. So then I knew I would never get into the Air Force, so I went, went to, the, to the Army and said, I want, to, I want to enlist. And they said, well, the Army Infantry is, is the place for you, and that was fine with me. Okay. Why were you interested in the Marine Corps? Why did you try two times? Well, because, you know, the Marines have that aura. They certainly did then, and they still do. That's that's where the action is going to be. So you wanted to be where the action was. Oh yeah, that that was my whole temperament. Once once I got into the army, once I got into combat, if I hadn't been wounded on Dallas Bay, I'm sure I would have been killed further down the line because. I wanted to be up front, up front, even though as the company executive officer by that time, I was supposed to be in the rear, but I couldn't stay back there. I went up with Carl Caracas and, and re, in essence took over my old platoon, the first platoon, and that's where I wanted to be. Why? Because that was my temperament. I wanted to be where the action was. In a situation like that, you're not af afraid anymore. The only fear I ever felt was before an act, an action started. Then I was really sick at the stomach and everything else. But once the action started, all of that disappear dissipates, and you think only of now. What am I supposed to do here? What will I do here? Did you know you were going to be like that? Were you like that in other things in your life before you joined the military? No, I, 
I found out though when I went to basic training, we, we fell out the first morning for calisthenics and I thought, this is for me, you know. I want to be a good soldier. That was my overriding concern from the day I went in. Okay. When did you actually join the Army after December 7th? Oh, it was probably about December the 20th long in there. And when did you go to basic training? April, and I don't remember the date, but it was in April sometime. And I had, by that time, I'd finished the second quarter, and CU gave everybody a quarter of freebie. And so I, in essence, graduated then, too. Okay, so you actually graduated from CU before you went? Yeah. Okay. So did you go in as an officer? No. I went in as a buck private. Never did uh, really give much thought to, to being an officer, though I did ride by the officer's club on the bus once. I thought, well, that'd be a good way to go. But the first inkling I got, uh, the company commander called me in and said he wanted to recommend me for Fort Benning Officer Candidate School. Would, was I interested? Well, I leaped like a trout for that, and I was, of course, really pleased. Mm -hmm. And um, where, where did you, you did basic where? At um, Camp Walters, Texas. Camp Walters, Texas. Camp Walters, Texas. And then from there you went? From there I went to Fort Benning to OCS, and from there I went to the 10th Mountain Division. Okay, so they identified you in basic training as officer material? Yes. How long had you been in it before they asked if you wanted to go to OCS? Oh, maybe two months. Okay. And from the first day you decided this is something you wanted to do? Oh, yeah. So did you find BASIC difficult? No, I, I loved it. I, I found that I had enormous physical endurance and the, the uh, sergeant that was in charge of our platoon made me the acting sergeant for the, that platoon. And after that, basically, I was the one that had control of the platoon and fell them in and fell them out and all that sort of thing. What was the interview like when they were trying to decide if you should go to uh, Officer's Candidate School? Well, I, I walked in and saluted and they said, sit down. And one of them was a kindly old colonel. <laughs> the other was a captain. And the third one, I don't remember what he was like. But they asked me some I would say perfunctory questions, and then the, the old colonel said, well, if you were pinned down by a machine gun, what would you do? And I said, I'd call for an airstrike. <laughs> that's, that's what we all thought, you know. And he said, well, suppose that didn't work. Well, what would you do? And I said, well, I'd take it out. <laughs> and they liked that answer. Oh, you know, yeah, he smiled. I suppose that that's probably what, you know, that was the end of the interview as far as they were concerned. Mm -hmm. So you finished basic training, then went to OCS school. Yeah. What was that like? What did you do there? What were the... Well, it was uh, about, well, they, what they call us, 19 week, I don't know, but it, it was about three months, between three and four months. And that was, that was easy too. and. The, the men, the other soldiers that were in my platoon in basic training were all ROTC graduates from, many of them from the University of Mississippi and Georgia and so on, and they, they didn't know anything about how to field strip a rifle, how to do this, how to do that, and so when they found out that I'd gone through basic training, they were all very interesting for me to show them, you know, how to field strip a rifle and how to do this with a machine gun, you know, all of that, which, you know, and I enjoyed being a teacher. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you finished that as a second lieutenant. Yeah. And your first assignment? My, my first and only assignment, really, until I was wounded, was the 10th Mountain Division. And I was assigned to Company B, 85th Mountain Infantry, 10th Mountain Division, and that's where I stayed. Okay. Where did you report after officer, where did you join up with uh, the 85th? At right? Camp Hale. 
So that was already up and running. Yeah. And oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, was that a volunteer outfit or were you assigned? Yeah, it was largely volunteer then, but as the war progressed and they had to send cadre out of the division elsewhere, including enlisted men, we began to get a large number of draftees. Why did you uh, volunteer for the 10th Mountain? Well, I guess mainly because it was located in Colorado. <laughs> and I, I, didn't, I didn't know anything about skiing or mountaineering. I've never had on a pair of skis. Tell me about Camp Hale. Did, what was it like when you first got there? How did you get there and what was, it, what was your first impression? Well, I, I suppose I got there by bus, but I don't really remember. But it, to me, it was just an army camp, you know, a lot of snow, the mountains, and all the rest of it. As far as you remember, was it completely built up when you were... Uh... L largely, yes, it was. Okay. Now, as a second lieutenant, did you take over 1st platoon? Yeah, and, and the, the, the third day I was there, we were supposed to have a week to acclimate. But the third day I was there, and they said, okay, Lieutenant, you're going to take out a, a beginner's class in snowshoeing. <laughs> I never had a pair of snowshoes on. I didn't know how to put them on. And one of the, of the uh, other soldiers that knew something about it helped me strap into them. <laughs> and we took off for an hour snowshoe trek. <laughs> None of the people with me knew anything about snowshoeing either. Where did you learn to ski? <laughs> right there at Camp Hale. About oh, shortly after that, I I had to go on a uh, an all day forced march on skis with my platoon. <laughs> and I didn't know anything about skiing. And, you, know, you can every time I tried to turn, you know I fell over into the snow, which, which was a, a great source of amusement to the, to the soldiers that knew how to ski. But they, uh, I think, well, in fact, one of them told me later at one of the reunions, I was sliding down this gentle slope, and I couldn't stop, so I disappeared <laughs> to his sight in a clump of trees, and he said, Everything was quiet, and everybody just stood and looked and wondering if this fool had killed himself. And he said, all of a sudden, the snow around the conifers started to shake, and I emerged. And he said, you know, he said, I said right then, I'll follow this officer anywhere. <laughs> So did you ever receive any formal instruction from all these fantastic skiers that were in the 10th Mountain? No, n not really. You know, they just expected that you'd put on a pair of skis and learn. Okay. Uh, do you remember the date you got there? I assume it was 1943 that you arrived? Yeah, it was, I, I think it was December uh, the 15th. Of 40, 1943? Yeah. Okay, so then... Um, what were your quarters like? Well, the officers' uh, barracks were, every, every officer, had, it was just a big barracks, but we all each had a separate room. And in, in my room, this was really the luck of the draw, I walked in and some previous occupant who obviously could draw had drawn a life-sized picture of a reclining nude on the wall. And it was very realistic and very erotic. <laughs> I assume you were the envy of the BOQ then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was glad I had that room, you know, to remember what a woman looked like. <laughs> now, the people that you picked up on first platoon on day one, were they the ones you trained with throughout the entire time? Yeah, I was very fortunate. I got a platoon sergeant, Sergeant Porky Porgio. He was an Italian from the Bronx. And he treated me wonderfully from day one. And you know, a lot of times these non-coms that had been in for a while, a, a new lieutenant took over and they, they, they were known to give you a hard time. But he was helpful, 
respected the rank, never any trouble, just a perfect platoon leader. Okay. Um, did you make friends right off the bat of fellow officers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Joe Brigandi, who was transferred later to another, I think another regiment, he and I became good friends. And, an officer named Wilbur Prime, and there were others, but you know, they many were transferred and so on. So then, about three months after you got there, the D series training came along. Yes, were you prepared for that? Were you well, a that, skier by then? By, by that time, we'd been doing an awful lot of mountaineering, you know, rappelling, rock climbing, skiing cross country, snowshoeing carrying that heavy pack, so well, we were in shape, and you know, I was, I was what, 22? You know, I was in perfect condition, you know, I weighed about 175 pounds, I could go all day and all night if necessary. Did you take to this kind of training the same way you took to basic training? Yeah, yeah, I, I loved doing my best in whatever situation I was in. That was my whole temperament. Okay. So tell me about D-Series. Well, we loaded up our, our rucksacks with everything in the world, and they weighed, as I remember, about 75 or 80 pounds. And when, when we could walk, we had the skis strapped to the packs, but once we got into the snow, we put on the skis and trudged on. So this was uh, like, what, three or four weeks out there? In the yeah, yeah. The, the officers, though, every week were brought back to Camp Hale to attend a, a seminar on what had transpired and where the weaknesses were and so on. And I used to spend a few minutes rushing into the PX and buying all the candy bars that I could carry. and. I'd take them back and dole them out among the platoon, keeping a, a good amount of them for myself. And you know, in that kind of an environment, you can consume huge amounts of sugar. And I, I used to eat probably two or three candy bars a day as long as I had them. Did you suffer frostbite or anything? Did you have any injuries from that? No, I, I was very fortunate. There were people though that got bad frostbite in their fingers and so on. I understand the weather was particularly bad during that. Yeah, it, in night it got down to, as I remember, around 30 below. And, you know, our, our beds were pine boughs with our sleeping bags spread on top of them. Because it, in, the, in the D series, you didn't, as I remember, we didn't ever pitch tents. Did you dig snow caves or were you just... Well, um, Bobby Lee, who was one of my squad leaders, and I were sent out on a, on a listening post where we could look across the valley. And we were out there for three days, so we, we took a tent with us, two tents as a matter of fact. And he and the other soldier that went with us were in one tent, and then I had another one. And we were all dressed in white camouflage outfits, and it was a nice vacation, really. We just sat around and ate and looked across the valley to do what we thought we ought to be doing. One thing I remember, you know, we'd had heavy snow and a lot of those fairly steep slopes, they were ready to, to slide any time. And we watched across the valley as a, I guess it was a platoon from another company skied across that treacherous area, and we were thinking all the time, my God, I hope it doesn't slide, you know, because if it had, the whole platoon would have been dead, but they made it across. What, uh, what was the, a routine at Camp Hill? Were you, did you train every day? What was your routine? Oh, well, we trained every day and Saturday up until noon. And we were off Saturday afternoon and all day Sunday. What did you do in the off time? 
oh, the officers club was down there and mainly we, we'd sleep, rest, put on our dress uniforms, go down to the officers club, have a few drinks, a nice meal, go home and go to bed. Did you ever go to Denver or anything on that time off? I went to Denver only once. Some people that, that had access to cars and maybe their wives were nearby or something, they were going down to Denver all the time or, or to Leadville, which wasn't very far away. But all the time we were at Camp Hale, I never once got to Leadville. I really didn't have any desire to leave the camp. I, I enjoyed the life there and the weekends I thought were wonderful just to be able to relax and eat at the officers club and all that. Okay. Were you aware of a certain, did you guys have, I should say, a certain esprit de corps? Uh, did you realize, did you think of yourselves as an, as an elite outfit? Yes, we did. Yeah, we did. Importantly, because the whole initial cadre were accomplished mountaineers, many uh, Dartmouth graduates and from other schools where there was skiing and they regarded themselves as an elite group and we began to regard the, the division as an elite group and I think it was so considered in the Army. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Now, um, <clears throat> According to what I've read, in September 1944, you guys were transferred to Camp Swift. Did you know there was a deployment coming? How did you, you know, you guys were there for two years. Did you ever wonder when you were going to be deployed? Did, were there rumors going around? Oh, yeah, we always expected it, and there we'd get this rumor, but nothing would come of it, and then another rumor, and so on. But when we got the rumor at Camp Swift, and the orders came down to start, you know, getting everything ship shape and starting to pack equipment and so on. We knew it wasn't going to be long then. Okay. Now, um, I don't see a lot of leave in here. Were you ever able to go back home to your hometown in Lamar, Colorado, at any time after you enlisted? Uh, yeah, I, I did. I had uh, I had a ten day leave when we were at Camp Swift. And I, I went home then. But, you know, all of those things to me are a, a blur because I was so totally oriented toward the 10th Mountain Division and what I was doing there that I don't remember too much about the time when I was away from the division. Interesting. But you did go home that 10-day yeah. period? Yeah. Okay. Do you remember at all how your parents felt about you and your brother going off to war? Were, do you remember that at all? Uh, yes, but you know they were they were proud that they had sons in the military. My brother, an officer in the navy, and I, an officer in the army. They were very proud about that. Did you and your brother ever see each other? Uh, yeah, when when we were at Camp Swift, Larry, for some reason, was going to be in. Uh, I guess it was. Dallas, was I, yeah, in Dallas, and, and he and he contacted me, and I was able to get a compassionate pass or whatever it was for for three days, and I went to Dallas, and we had part of the day together, and a good dinner that evening, and the, the next morning, and then he had to go on to his station, and I went back to Camp Hale okay. or Camp Swift. Um, now, the uh, books that I read described Camp Swift as the most unpleasant experience. What well, is your recollection? It was hot and dusty and just a humidity sometimes and other times no. And it was it was not a pleasant place, particularly since we just come from Camp Hale and we're pretty much adjusted, you know, psychologically and physically to that, and then come down there to that Texas heat. It was miserable. When you left uh, Camp Swift, did you know where you were going to Italy? Did, how specific were, was your knowledge about where you were going? I, I suppose we knew, but I don't remember whether we knew or not. But I, th I think we, we got on the trains and 
found out we were headed, I think it was Newport News, I'm not sure, now. And of course, once we got there, we boarded the SS America, which was a luxury liner that had been converted to a uh, troop ship. And we were packed in there like sardines. What were your quarters like as an officer? Well, I, I shared a, a small cabin with either nine or ten other officers. And the, 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 the men were down below the water line in these compartments, you know, a whole platoon in a, a compartment that was not very large and we ran into rough weather and those that were susceptible to, to seasickness, it, it was sad, you know, they were vomiting into their helmets and up at the, on the mess deck where they, where everybody ate in shifts, I'm not exaggerating, the hallway outside the mess deck was probably three inches deep in vomit. Oh, it was awful. How long did that last? How long was the trip over and how long was it like that? Well, it seems to me it, it wasn't like that for too long because, you know, they were able to get cleaning crews going from among the soldiers and from among the sailors. and. Once everybody had emptied, emptied his stomach out, <laughs> probably many of them only ate sparingly after that. Did you get seasick? I felt queasy, but fortunately I didn't ever get to the point of vomiting. When there was a routine day on the troop ship, what was it like? I can't tell you because we were so busy and under so much stress you only have little episodic memories. What were you doing that was making, that was causing dizziness and stress? Well, one one night, and I I was slept down in the in the hold on my shift with the men in the in the platoon. It was a really stormy night, and these waves had hit the side of the ship, and it sounded like really a, a telephone pole battering ram hitting the size of that ship. And once when we were down there at night, they got a submarine alert. Well, I'll tell you, if, you better, if I had ever been frightened in my life, I was scared to death. You say when you went down, did officers go down periodically? Was there always an officer down yeah. in the hole? Yeah, we had, it seems to me, we had three three or four shifts a day, and when your shift was on, you were down there for six hours or eight hours, whatever it was. Was there any opportunity for the soldiers to get up and walk around the ship, or were they pretty uh, much... Occasionally, yeah, and some of them would be rotated so they would get all the way up and be able to walk on the deck for a while, but they didn't get too much of that. It was miserable. What kind of shape were you in physically when you got there? You went on the ship as a finely tuned athlete. What were you like when you got <laughs> off? Very grateful to get off. That's all I can tell you. But we, we pulled into the harbor in Naples, and that's the first time I'd seen what war leaves behind. There were stacks of sunken ships sticking up out of the water, and all of the buildings around the harbor were just rubble. And it, wh when we, our turn, that is my platoon, our company had uh, our turn to unload, debark, the first sight that met my eye was an old Italian man squatting, relieving himself <laughs> right along the path where we were uh, going up to the, wherever we went. Okay. Tell me some more about the Italian people that you ran into. How long it had been since Naples had been leveled like that? Oh, well, it's, it was, oh, I, don't, I don't remember when it was, but it had been a long time anyway because the battle had moved from that area up to uh, beyond Pisa. Mm -hmm which is beyond Florence. So did the, how did the Italian people look? Did they look stunned? Did they look like they were recovering? What kind of... Well, the, the only ones we really saw, because they were not supposed to be allowed into wherever we were bivouacked, were these poor young girls, like, you know, 
14, 15, 16. They were there begging for food and promising favors. It was sad, you know, because they were malnourished and bad complexions and you hated to see people reduced to that level of privation. Now, once you got off the ship, were you moving continuously up to the front lines or were there no, pauses we, in the action? We, we got off the ship and we, I guess we were probably uh, billeted in the remains of a warehouse and, and the next day a whole group of uh, landing craft infantry pulled into the harbor and a platoon at a time boarded those and we went off up, up the coast to, I suppose, to Pisa, I'm not sure. And that, that took uh, oh, a good while. We were on the, on the landing craft at night. And the first time I'd ever seen the ocean, you know, that, that close in the, in the wake of the ship, the turmoil in the water activated these animals that, that glowed, you know, and so the wake was just like stars, a myriad of stars out there. That that really impressed me. I'll never forget that. Uh, so that was a landing craft infantry LCI. Yeah, How LCI. big is that? Oh, as I remember, it was probably 50 or 60 feet long, and maybe, I don't remember, 10, 15 feet wide. What was the accommodation for your platoon? Were people standing? Could they sit on the floor? Or what was? No, they had a lot of bunks. These places had been fitted out for, you know, ferrying troops around as well as and there were probably others that weren't fit out that way that were used for the actual landings. But I remember when we uh, when we went on board. Of course, there were three or four young Navy officers in charge of the ship. They were the same age we were. And they said, well, you, you officers, however many of us there were, will eat here with us. And the, the men ate in a different section of the ship. And they said, well, for dinner tonight we have horse cock and cheese. <laughs> cheese and bologna. <laughs> That's another thing I'll, I'll never forget. <laughs> so you di dined like a Navy gentleman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But they were they weren't eating any better than we were at least at that time there. <laughs> okay, so that was like an overnight trip. Yeah. Okay. Um, then, when did you? What take me from there up to the uh, Mount Gorgolesco battle? What was going on in that well, time period? Well, first we, we debarked at P Pisa and were taken by truck. Well, maybe we marched, I don't remember, to a, a bivouac area where we spent, I don't know, several days and, and nights picking up final equipment, you know, ammunition and all that sort of thing. And during that time, the weather was pretty nice, though it was February, mm -hmm. yeah. And we were able to, you know, get leave during the day. And, a couple of other officers and I went to Pisa and we, we were able to take the stairs up to the top of the leaning tower and ring the bell. And there was nobody, you know, really watching the place and everybody that got up there rang one of the bells a few times, which I thought was a bad scene because we probably ended up cracking the bell or something. <laughs> um, okay. Now, uh, when you finally got fitted out, what did you carry into combat yourself? How were you armed? Well, I I was supposed to carry a, a, an M1 carbine, but they were puny guns, you know, and so I carried a, a, an M1 rifle, just, just like uh, all the infantry soldiers carried, which was a wonderful, trustworthy weapon, and you knew if you needed it, it was going to work. How much ammunition? Well, as much as we could comfortably carry, but before an attack, we would always drop our, our packs and, and they would 
sometimes make it up to where we finally ended up. But the, the very first battle, which was Mount Gorgolesco, my pack never did get there. So the, the, the next day we were patrolling around and there was a, a dead 10th Mountain man that his comrades, while he was still alive, had put into his sleeping bag. So, you know, we didn't, we didn't uh, scruple about it. We gently took him out of the sleeping bag and I kept it and used it for my own. You know, one of the things that really struck me, though, with, with that soldier and then others that I saw in German soldiers, so often they were dead, but there was no discernible mark on them. I suppose if they were killed instantly, there wasn't much blood, and many, many weren't blown to pieces or anything, just maybe a few pieces of shrapnel hit them somewhere. Were you a first lieutenant by that point? Uh, yes, I was. Were you still a platoon leader or were you? I, I was the first platoon leader of the first platoon. As a first lieutenant? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, now, uh, in your uh, friends, whose name I can't pronounce. Carl Caracas. Caracas describes a, uh, a patrol, it sounds like, that you were on where the colonel was unhappy with the way things oh, were yeah. going. Tell me about that. Bruce Coggins, who was also a dear friend, and I were given command of this 50-man combat patrol. And our objective was uh, up in the mountains where it was nothing but snow because there was a lot of activity up there and they couldn't figure out what was there, so they wanted us to go up there and, if possible, knock out what, whatever was up there. So we left uh, Montefagatese where, where we were billeted, this little village, and marched all night down a path that we, we couldn't see, but I guess whoever was leading us could. We all had luminous tags on the back of our packs and we followed that luminous tag in front of us. Then when, when daylight came, we were where we could uh, assemble out of sight of that mountain area. And we got all ready to go there and Bruce and I took the thing out and went up as high as we could without getting into the vision field of whoever was up in the, in the German setup. And d during the night, we had to spend the night then, it snowed, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face, and when the time came to jump off, we'd been given a nine o'clock thing, it was snowing so hard we, we couldn't tell where we were. So on my, I was in, in charge and Bruce was the second in command in the platoon. I said, well, we're going to stay right here until this snow stops so we'll orient ourselves and then go on. Well, that's what we were doing and we were supposed to break radio silence, but suddenly radio silence was broken and it was Colonel Woolley, the battalion commander, who, by the way, never liked me for reasons I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, he said, Cray, where are you? I, t I told him, he said, why aren't you on the objective? And I explained why. And he said, you're relieved. Turn that platoon over to Coggins and you report back to battalion headquarters as fast as you can get here. I, I turned to, to Bruce and I said, you heard him. But I said, I'm not leaving. I'm going to go with you. You're in command now. And he said, no, I'm not. <laughs> you, you brought it this far. <laughs> You're going to take it the rest of the way, which, which I did. And when we, we got up there, I don't know, I suppose it was around noon. And fortunately, the, the 13 men that were in this little outpost, and they had a, a really nice bunker. And I, I can see why they were inside resting, and they never expected anybody. But 
we hadn't made any any noise and we spread out in a perfect skirmish line skirmish line across the snow field and I thought God if they ever find out we're here and have any time at all we're all dead meat I was over on one flank and there was a steep drop off I slipped and all of a sudden I was sliding down this thing I couldn't even see the, the troops Fortunately, I was able to stop myself and I was carrying at that time foolishly a submachine gun and the submachine gun hit on something and the bottom dropped out of the ammunition and all the ammunition fell out. But the first thing, I stopped myself and a soldier came to the edge and peered over and I said, go, go. <laughs> I managed to get up there in no time at all and we went right on up to the objective and they were still inside unaware that we were there and in the meantime Bruce Coggins had set up the machine guns back where he had an overlook so that if they had discovered us hopefully he might have been able to neutralize them. But anyway we Somebody spoke German and we shouted at them to come out, their hands up. Well, unfortunately, it turned out that they were Italians <laughs> and they refused to come out. So we threw a few grenades up on the roof and that still didn't uh, shake them up enough so they'd come out. And then a, one of the young soldiers said, Lieutenant, I, I've got a thermite grenade. I'll I'll go around to the front and throw it in the door. Well, we covered him so, and he went up there and gutsy kid, you know, a lot of things like that happened and you wish that at the time you'd been able to take their name, rank, serial number and recommend them for something, but there was so much action you weren't even thinking in terms of that. This kid threw that thermite grenade through there. He threw it and the next instant it came sailing out and well, of course, everybody ducked and that thing exploded and you know what they were like, it was terrible. But anyway, the, the, the soldiers inside decided they, they would surrender and so they waved something white out and we told them come out and it turned out there were 13 of them there as I remember. Did you lose any men on that? Uh... Not a man scratched. Not not a shot fired, in fact, except the, the grenades that we threw on top and then the thermite grenade that, that the kid threw in through the door. And, you know, I'm grateful to this day that, that one of those Italians got to that thing and threw it out before it went off because, my God, that would have been terrible, you know. 11, 12, 13 men in a, in a hut. <laughs> Uh, was that before Italy had surrendered, or? No, no. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that that was before the Italians surrendered. Okay. What did the colonel say when you guys got back? Well, he said, "Report to my headquarters the the next day." And uh, what could he say when I got there? I mean, it was a wonderful success. Nobody got hurt. We took. I'll say 13 prisoners, it was 11, 12, or 13. What was there to say, you know? But he, he said, Cray, I'm going to be watching you from now on. And I said, yes, sir, I saluted and left. Now, were you, was the snow deep that you guys are walking through, or you weren't on skis? Well, it, it was on our skirmish. Well, yeah, it was, it was up to here. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it was hard moving, and you know, and that's we formed this skirmish line and moved across the snow field, and you know that that took a little while. I can't tell you now how long it took, but probably at least a couple of minutes. And boy, you're out there exposed. <laughs> okay. um, then that, okay. Then from that point, what where, what developed there? Well, after that combat patrol, shortly after that, 
was when we moved into an assembly area to uh, as, as, <coughs> launch an assault on Mount Gorgolesco. And our, our objective was one of the ridges that ran off of Mount Gorgolesco. And I don't remember what the name of it was, but everybody refers to it as Gorgolesco. Okay. Um, now, uh, that was all part of the Reaver Ridge Mount Belvedere yeah. operation. Were you yeah. aware that that Reaver Ridge thing was going on? How much, and, and as a corollary to that question, how much are you aware of what's going on in the whole operation? Very little, very little. In the first place, even, you're briefed, of course, but what you're interested in and focused on is what do we do? Because as far as you're concerned, that's what counts. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, so when did you, did you guys push off or start or whatever you call it? Oh, it was a nighttime assault, which was basically a fiasco. Carl Carrick has kept a diary during the time we were over there, and this is from uh, February the 19th. Night attack, no ammo and weapons, bayonets and grenades only, much confusion. First and third platoons lose many men, pitiful slaughter. Take objective around 530. Lieutenant Cray takes final objective single-handed, a seemingly impossible feat. And then he goes on. Okay, so tell me about it. Well... What's the no ammunition? Tell me about that. Well, foolishly, they didn't want us to have any ammunition and in our rifles. You know, we had ammunition with us because they were afraid we'd be shooting each other in the dark. Well, as, as, as it happened, we got close to our objective, was, I suppose it was about midnight, and uh, German machine guns opened up all over the place. All you could see were tracers, and everybody, including myself, hit the dirt, and there we stayed the rest of the night and periodically the Germans would fire grazing fire. And the, the uh, one, one of my uh, squad leaders who was right in front of me, he said, he whispered, he said, God, Lieutenant, I'm hit. Well, even though he was lying prone, a machine gun bullet had entered the, that big back muscle and exited along the same muscle it hadn't hit any bone or anything. Well, I was able to get to my uh, first aid kit, and I got a, a compress, a bandage, and worked my hand up under his shirt and put that over the what the only wound that I was able to find, and that that was all I could do. And I, I told him, I said, you know, crawl back to the. Uh, to where it's safe and then walk back to the aid station and, and that's what he did. I mean, he, he came through okay. So was it like you could see tracers going over you? Oh, it was it was hell. You, you, you lay there. I wasn't afraid in the sense that you think of fear. I was just thinking if they hit me, I hope it's quick and easy, you know. And people, occasionally somebody would scream, you know, in situations like that. It's, uh, it's just pitiful. Well, as soon as uh, it got light enough to see, everybody was, some of us had, some of them had been able to scratch out depression, you know, even lying on their side and were in that. Well, I could see where the, where the one machine gun that was really bothering us was located. I didn't see any people, but I could do where it was. And I thought, well, you know, I've got to get it. And there was a, a, a young kid, John Shields, was next to me over there. And I could 
tapped him on the helmet and said, you know, cover me. <laughs> and I, I crawled about, I suppose, 40 feet up this fairly gentle slope to where I knew the machine gun was. When I got there, I saw this little parapet and I had my M1 and I'd loaded it during the night. And I jumped up and there they were, four of them sitting behind this machine gun. Fortunately for me and unfortunately for them, they had not been alert. And I emptied that M1 eight rounds. I can see them yet, you know, they jerk and they quiver and they, oh, it was terrible. I, I still think about that. Those are the only people that I, know that I killed and it's it's not a pleasant thing. Was, I, I, you know, I had no grudge against Germans per se, as Carl Caracas didn't either. He and I talked about that later and said, no, they were they were doing their duty just like we were doing our duty. Why do you think they weren't alert? Oh, they'd probably been there all night and uh, they probably thought they'd killed most of us. They, because there were a fair number of, of dead people lying around. And uh, I don't know, maybe they thought we'd retreated in the night. I don't know what they thought. So basically you spent the night 40 feet away from a German machine gun that was yeah, shooting at flat you? Yeah, on, flat on my stomach. And you, you know what I thought as I was crawling up there? I said, dear God, don't let me take the burst in the face. <laughs> there was something about having my head blown to bits that horrified me, the thought of it. But fear, it wasn't, it wasn't fear, it was just total concentration and I hope it happens this way. So um, you were standing there exposed, you shot these guys, yeah. and then what happened? Well I started screaming at them, you know, come on, come up, and they, some of them, got up and started and then others got up and the first thing, you know, oh, probably not more than a couple of minutes, everybody was up. There, were, there was a waist-high trench line dug all along here and we were all in that and we, we saw just off to the left in a little cul-de-sac there was a stack of brush and the brush was quivering. So. I walked over and with the, the barrel of my rifle I flicked the brush aside and there was this little kid in there. He, he was a soldier but he didn't look, look like he was 14 years old and he was just scared to death. Well, I mean, I just waved him to the rear and then there was a dugout down the, the slope and we knew there were people in there. but. By this time, you know, they didn't dare stick their head out because we had everything aimed at that. And our, our, one of our kids that spoke some German shouted at them to come out. And first they wouldn't do it, so we put a, a few machine gun rounds through the door and they came out, there was a, a young officer and I don't remember how many men and we took all of them prisoner and sent them to the rear. And that, that was the last real action that we saw in connection with Mount Gorgolesco. But one of the beautiful sights after we took our objective and then it was C Company moved out from where they were and a beautiful skirmish line went up the, the slopes of Mount Gor Gorgolesco to the top and then disappeared over the top and about that time then Germans started coming back from where they'd been overrun by C Company and I remember one had a, a gaping wound in his shoulder which was and he was an old man really he was an old man white beard you know stubble and his hair was white and I, oh my god and I Oh, and his snow, his snowsuit pants had fallen down around his ankles, and he was afraid to stop to try to get him off for fear somebody would shoot him. 
and, and the fellow with him, you know, they were, they were like that. So we helped him out of his snowshoe thing and sent him on to the rear. But he wasn't bleeding much, but oh, I could see that, that wound yet. It was huge. But anyway. Now, uh, were these uh, crack German troops or uh, what kind of, you, you described well, a, an old man and a boy. We, I know, but we heard that we were being faced with one of the crack German divisions, I guess, but you know, by this time the Germans had taken a lot of casualties and even though it was a first class regiment or division, they had a lot of replacements and they were scraping the bottom of the barrel of manpower. Okay. Did you witness or were you aware of any of this shooting of prisoner stuff? That, uh, I, I was not, and if, if it had ever started to happen on my watch, it wouldn't have gone on but about two shots. Were, but I heard later, this was long after the war, that one of the uh, soldiers that I trusted went back with a group of four prisoners, and the rumor is that he shot all of them. I would, that's, I would never have tolerated anything like that. Okay. Um, now, I, I kind of envision this being a, a battle for a peak, and then yeah. a battle for another peak. Was there a lull between peaks, or did you fight well, your way down the hill and back up the next no, side? <laughs> once we took this ridge, that was the end of our responsibility on this particular operation. And others, other units, other uh, companies and so on, finished up the thing. And by, I'd say by noon, everything was quiet and the battle had moved on and others were carrying it. And we were ordered to dig in along this ridge that we'd taken, which we did. And we were there, I can't remember, it was, days though we were there and we did a little patrolling at night, listening patrols and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. but now after the encounter with the machine gun nest, did you have time to think about this horrible thing that you'd just done or was it such that, okay, now I just have to keep going or? Well, you know, I thought about it, but you know, when, when, it's, when it's them or you, maybe you don't want to do it and maybe you regret doing it, but Nevertheless, you, you did it, and you do it again in the same situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so that was like February the 21st, and then uh, Dallas Bay was like 5 or 6 March. Yeah, whenever. I, yeah. I really don't, don't remember the dates. Okay. Uh, then you got the Silver Star for that, correct? Yeah, that machine gun thing, yeah. And when does one know that one's been put up for an award? I mean, well, I didn't know about any of this stuff until after, basically after the war, and when I was in the hospital in Menlo Park, I began getting these notices that you've been awarded this and you've been awarded that, but I never did hear uh, about the Silver Star until, oh, it was in the 1990s, after I'd been to Sun Valley, one of the other officers in, the, in our company had sent clippings home to his parents and one of them said, told about Lieutenant Craig being awarded the Distinguished Service Cross and for an earlier action I think on Mount Gorgolesco he received the Silver Star. But I never did get anything official about the Silver Star. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Okay, now, um, at this point were you still, when did you become the assistant company commander? Well, I, I became the, well, I was still a, a platoon leader, but the company executive officer had been wounded on the approach march to this place, and so he was out of action, and wh whether I was considered the executive officer then, I don't remember. But that first night on Gorgolesco, when we were pinned down, our company commander 
in essence, deserted and wanted me to desert with him, which I refused to do and crawled back up to where my platoon was. And then when that was all over for a brief few days, I was the company commander. And then they sent Lieutenant St. Louis from another company or battalion, I forget which, and he had a lot more seniority, and I think Colonel Woolley had a lot more confidence in him, and he, he took over, and he was very concerned, you know, that, you know, how would I feel because he was taking over, and it didn't bother me any. Okay. Um, without mentioning names, what became of that captain? Well, he, he came, came back up well, three or four days after the, the battle and we were dug in and, you know, enjoying ourselves, sitting in the sun and so on. And he wanted me to write a commendation saying what a wonderful officer he was. And uh, I looked at him and I took a sheet of paper and I wrote that Captain so-and-so always was an exemplary officer in discharging the paperwork and other things connected with the company. And I handed it back to him and he said, well, I can't use this. And I said, well, that's all you're going to get from me. And he, he left and I never saw him again. But I understand, as so often happens, that he got promoted to a major and was put in charge of a, a trucking company. So you were acting company commander at that time when he came yeah. up to ask for the... Oh, yeah. Where had he been? <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> in, the, in the rear, yeah. in, in, where it was safe. Okay. So now, what was uh, Company B's assignment on Dallas Bay? What was your... Well, you know, we there were B Company and C Company, I think, were the attacking echelons, and then I suppose A Company and the Heavy Weapons Company were back here in the rear somewhere and we moved up all day and I remember we moved through one small valley that had the Germans had good good vision on <laughs> and they were firing 88 rounds periodically well we were moving across this field when 88 rounds started coming in we took cover behind a great big boulder and the, those rounds, it had rained or the snow had just melted and the ground was really soft. And the rounds would hit the mud, throw up mud, but they didn't explode, which was very fortunate for us. And then we, I don't know, I remember seeing a half a dozen of those things hit the mud, throw up mud, and did not explode. And then, I don't know, then there weren't, weren't any more rounds. Maybe they'd been overrun or something, and we got up and moved on. Was this direct fire they could see when shoot, shooting straight at you? Yeah. This wasn't arching oh, artillery yeah, well, I'm sure it was a direct line of sight because an, an 88, the German 88 was a direct, direct line of sight weapon. In the movies, the 88s have a very distinctive sound. Do you, were you aware of anything like that? Well just recognized yeah. it was an 88. Yeah. I can't tell you too much about the distinctive sounds. Okay. But you, you could tell an incoming round at, at night particularly because they would kind of as they were going over and then our counter battery fire was more a Okay. What's it like to be uh, shelled by artillery? What, what is it like? Well, at, after we took a, a, a midterm executive heading for Dallas Bay, who was that? Yeah. We cleaned off this hilltop, which was very lightly defended, and they had waist high trenches. And basically, a large part of our company was was in those waist high trenches when mortar shells started coming in and the only cover we had was from the waist down so all of us were squat bent over 
lying on the back and the rear end of the man in front of us, and that went on long enough that the torture of your legs and standing like that was excruciating. But fortunately, not one of those mortar shells fell into one of the to the trench complex. It was just, you know, dumb luck. And then it just stops, and then you get up and go. Is well, it? as soon as the mortar barrage stopped, we got up and moved on, and uh, I can't remember. Well, then then we we launched the. I guess at that time, but you know, other soldiers would have an entirely different right. recollection of this. But as I remember, then we launched the all-out assault on on Dallas Bay, and Carl Carrick's platoon was on the left, and I had taken command of the first platoon. No, he was on the right, and I was on the left, and we had a, a preparatory artillery barrage. And they were supposed to stop precisely at a certain time, and it didn't stop. And we knew time was running out. Carl got on the radio and screamed at him, you know, "God damn it! Cut off that barrage! We're moving out!" And it stopped, and whew, away we went up to the up to the crest and cleared that off, and then we. Fell, we left people, you know, just watch what was going on. We fell back below the crest and started digging in, which we did. Was this all after dark? No, it was still daylight then. And I remember we were, the officers and others were huddling here, you know, assigning sectors and so forth and so on when, <coughs> uh, mortar shells started coming in, so we all hit the dirt. And one one exploded so close to me that I could feel the heat in my inner thighs because I was spraddled out like this. And, and it, it didn't touch me. It didn't touch anybody else either. Now, what are the basic principles of once you take a crest, how do you defend it? What, what are the well, basic you, principles? You, Keep men posted right where some there are always places where you behind a boulder somewhere where you can see down the other slope without being exposed yourself, and you leave that those people doing that, and then everybody else falls back below the crest and starts digging in, and believe me, you dig as fast as you can dig because you're anticipating a counterattack, I presume. Well. Uh, we got a, the first counterattack came that night when it was full dark, and we were fortunate there, you know. But on the other hand, we were in control of the of the crest, and if they tried to counterattack, then we'd have had all the advantage. How many counterattacks did you get that night? That night we got, as I recall, and others tell me because I was in and out, you know, I regained consciousness. And then when, when were you injured? Okay, the first counterattack, it, it was full dark. Les McDermott, who was my platoon guide, he was a staff sergeant, and he and I, I, I loved him like a brother. You know, he and I were out together inspecting the people, and was, as you would expect, we found some of them asleep, you know, instead of we were nudging them awake and moving on down, all of a sudden this counter this counterattack hit, and God, you can just see muzzle flashes all over the place. And we started firing back, of course, and people were throwing grenades, and, and I don't know whether it was a mortar shell or what, but landed very close to me. And I felt like it was in a concrete mixer. That was my only sensation. Then the, my next sensation was hitting the ground like that, and probably I was just blown flat, you know. And I was fully conscious, but I knew there was something wrong with my leg, and I reached down and, you know, that wet pop you get of blood coming through cloth, and I, I thought, the only thought I had, I didn't have any fear, I thought, God, this is a hell of a place to die. And then, you know, 
I relaxed. <laughs> the, the, the rest of the people beat off the counterattack, and then I called up and said, you know, Sergeant McDermott and I are down here wounded, so be careful, don't throw any grenades down here. And somebody crawled down and dragged me to a foxhole, and that's where I spent the rest of the night, sometimes conscious and sometimes unconscious. And during one of the counterattacks, uh, one of the uh, platoon sergeants or squad leaders panicked and he started screaming, we had, to, we had to evacuate, we had to evacuate, we had to fall back. And my job then, I, fortunately I was conscious, was to, you know, shout at them, if we give it up tonight, we're going to have to retake it tomorrow morning. And fortunately, everybody held firm. Okay. And then you were just kind of going in and out? And going in and out. And I wasn't really aware of, of the third and fourth counterattacks at all. But I heard later that the last counterattack, the soldiers, the German soldiers that they killed and whose bodies they found. They had luncheons with them, lunch with them, and they thought they'd overrun us and retake the objective. But a kid is always often just a kid, even by my standards. You know, some 18-year-old, he was a BAR man, which is a heavy weight automatic weapon. The, the, the last counterattack he stood up and turned that BAR on its side and held the trigger down, and I guess he really mowed him down. And that, that was it. That broke the back. So those attacks were supported by mortars? And yeah. Of course, the, the mortars would be before the, they got there. When their troops got to the objective, of course, they stopped firing mortar rounds. But in the meantime, our mortars were firing over trying to hit in the area where their troops might be concentrating. Mm -hmm. uh, and you were wounded a couple of times that night? <clears throat> well, I, I picked up, I don't know, 11 or 12 uh, shrapnel wounds from that mortar, or from that mortar shell. But as I was being evacuated, they moved me on a stretcher not far away. And Carl Caracas was there and Captain Johnson and for some reason, they, they, they stopped. At a, and about that time, um, this was full morning, a mortar shell hit in a tree. And of course, it sprayed the area with shrapnel and another piece hit me in the hip. And that, that was the second time. You remember talking to Carl and the Captain yeah, Johnson? Yeah. So, you know, he has one memory of it and I have another memory. Captain Johnson had always wanted a P-38, and people, that was a pretty nifty looking German pistol, and a lot of the kids in the platoon and so on would get these P-38s, and they knew I liked P-38s, so they were giving me these P-38s, and I, I had one with me that night in my, in my jacket, and, and Captain Johnson came along. I was, he was talking to me, and I pulled that P-38, and he said, here's the P-38 you wanted, Captain. I had enormous admiration for him. He, he was the best senior officer I ever served under. What was his role at that time? I think he was a battalion, uh, he was a, on the battalion staff by that time anyway. Okay. Now, um, Talk about a battlefield. Take, let's pick that one. What do they sound like, smell like, feel like? Well, you know, at, at the time of the uh, of the actual battle, of course, it's all noise and confusion and shouting and screaming. You, I guess we screamed a lot, you know, relieving the tension and fighting down our own panic, I guess. But the, the minute that was over, you'd calm down. The thing that amazed me, paper. There were, paper everywhere. And I, to this day, I don't understand where all that paper came from. Some of it seemed to be letters and some of it toilet paper. And I don't know what 
what most of it was, was that, you know, I didn't have time to stop and <laughs> pick it up, but then, you know, there will be dead lying around, your own dead and German dead, and you collect your own dead and your own wounded and get them off as fast as you can back to the aid station or the collecting point. The German dead, we just, we left them there. It got cold at night and, and they froze, and I, I'm talking about now after Gorgolesco. And I remember one, one kid, again, another kid, they were all kids that did this. He came up with his mess tin and whatever he was eating, and he couldn't find a place to sit, so he sat on a dead German, you know. Well, that's the <laughs> well, and uh, so you were taken off the hill. Where do you remember what your chain of events after that? Where did you go to the aid station? Where did you have a surgery? What? Well, I, I guess obviously I went to the aid station, but I think I was unconscious most of the way. But when we got down to the aid station, they were doing triage, you know, which is the ones that are have died move them off to the side, the ones that need immediate care but will survive, they take them in, then they're the other wounded. They're wounded, they need care, but they'll be okay out here for an hour or whatever it takes. And I was one of the group that they said, well, he'll survive. So I was out there on a stretcher. I was just, you know, I suppose I lapsed in and out, but I was comfortable, you know. <laughs> and I was back at the aid station. We. Had, all of us thought, if we get wounded, if we get back to the aid station, we're probably going to be all right. And I was lying there, and the Catholic chaplain for our battalion, or maybe it was a regiment, I don't remember, came by and knelt down. He said, Lieutenant, have you made your peace with God? Which I thought was an odd thing to say. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, chap when I made my peace with God long before I got here and uh, kind of turned my face away from him and he took the hint and left. So then you finally got surgery at that level? or Yeah, yeah. Boy, that was painful because, you know, they had to take you off the stretcher and put you up on an x-ray table so they could see where the fragments, they could see where they went in, but they didn't know where they were then. and. You were having to change position all the time. Of course, they were helping you, and by that time, boy, every every move hurt. But that was finally over, and then they knocked me out and operated on me. I guess when I came to, I had bandages. In fact, I think my whole leg was bandaged, and I had I don't know seven or eight wounds in my right leg, and couple in my hip and one in my chest. And I was very fortunate because the, the fragment had gone through my arm there into my chest and it lodged near the heart. It was a small fragment. And then they said, well, it's not doing any harm there, so then it would be risky to take it out. So they just left it there and it's still there today. Remember any pain around your face or anything? Did well, I, I looked my, my uh, my right eye had been blinded by a shell fragment that had hit, I guess, in my, at my brow and then deflected down into the eye. They, they took that out. Now, where was all this surgery happening? Do you remember? Well, all this surgery was done at the, what I call the aid station. It was a mash unit, I guess, you know, the, like, in the, in the TV series. Battalion level care or? Well, I, th I, th I think that was set up for the whole regiment, but I'm not okay. sure. They, they had several tents, of course, after this great battle on Mount De La Spey, they were wounded everywhere. Mm -hmm. Then where did you go from there? From there, after a brief period of time, several days, they loaded us into ambulances and they took us to, uh, I 
think they took us all the way to Naples because I remember the only view I got of Florence was through the ambulance window and I remember being struck by the beautiful, beautifully gowned Italian women that I glimpsed as we were driving by because, of course, by that time the battle had been long beyond Florence for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then how did you get back to the United States? Well, after X days or weeks or whatever, we were loaded in, into a cargo plane and, and started back and we spent the first night in, uh, I think, Casablanca. And then the second second day, I guess we went all the way on and uh, landed and we were offloaded in Coral Gables and I spent two or three days in uh, a very nice hotel <laughs> and a room all to myself in the luxury hotel in Coral Gables. Then they decided where they would send us depending on our injuries and they gave me several possibilities, Fitzsimmons or Menlo Park in California. And I, I ended up in, anyway, Dibble General Hospital in Menlo Park. Fly or train? How did you get there? Uh, I, think, I think they flew us. Again, I, I'm not sure how we got there. Do you remember being able to talk to your parents at any point in this phase? When did you first get to talk to them? Probably when I got to Menlo Park, I suppose, because I don't recall. But a, an officer who had been wounded at the same time, had, but was fully ambulatory, had gotten back to the States before I did, and he called my parents and told them, you know, that I was basically okay and alive and would be back in the States soon. They'd probably gotten a generic telegram or something before then? That yeah, 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 they had. And they, they'd also gotten an email, you know, those letters, not the email of email. today. V-mail, yeah. And uh, I mentioned, I, I said, I, I look like Wiley Post now because, you know, he only had one eye. That's about it. Okay. And how long were you in Menlo Park at that time? Oh, I think I'm, I got there probably in, let's see, it was April, May, probably in June, and I was there until October. Okay. That was, that was good duty because we, you know, we were all ambulatory by that time, and we had unlimited leave in, in the evening, you know, once we'd had our physical exam or follow-up surgery or whatever, then we were free until the, the next appointment. And we, as soon as we got our bearings, we started taking the uh, commuter train into San Francisco and we'd eat and drink and come back to the, to the hospital at Menlo Park. Did you require further surgeries? Yeah, they did some further operating on my eye, but by that time there wasn't much that they could do and all the stitches and everything had been taken out of my leg. But I, during the, the ward I was in, there were three or four captains and several lieutenants, and one of the captains had been awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor and was shortly thereafter flown back to Washington, D.C., and when he came back he had a big glossy print of himself and other Congressional Medal of Honor winners. And his was being pinned on by President Truman. Of course, I, I assume they did that for everybody, but boy, we were impressed because, God, he, he had uh, been wounded. They were taking this objective in this town. He'd been wounded, but there was a machine gun nest in the basement of a, a building. And there was a window there. And he, he ran across the intervening distance and dived headfirst through the window with his rifle and grenades and I gather really killed a whole bunch of people and in essence cleaned out the cellar himself and survived, though he 
it was at that time, but he, he, he lost his eye completely and had various other wounds too. But boy, he deserved the Congressional Medal, I'll tell you. Do you remember his name? No. Okay. So, and during that time you visited your brother in San Diego, Coronado? Yeah, yeah. The lieutenant colonel that was in the ward lived in San Diego and he had a convertible and I asked him, you know, if he'd take me to Coronado with him because my brother was stationed there and he said, sure. So we we went and I, he let me off at the, at the ferry and I took the ferry over to Coronado, which that's all there was then. <laughs> Larry had told me, I can't remember whether he met me or not, but he said, I'm at the Hotel Del Coronado, which was as posh then as it is now, just in a little bit different era. <laughs> he had a room all to himself up on the third floor, whatever it was. And I thought, boy, the, the Navy lived, Navy officers lived a lot better than infantry officers did. When did you get out of the Army? I think it was sometime in October. Of 45? Yeah. So I, the war was over by then. Oh, yeah. VE and they even were, VJ, everything. Yeah. They were still, I guess they weren't even, no, they didn't even have to worry about Japan by then. Yeah, well, that was August. Yeah. Okay. But I remember the, the, the 10th was slated to go on to Japan. And just, oh, a couple of years ago, a, a friend of a friend had gone to the archives and the preliminary battle estimates of casualties and so on had been prepared for a landing of Japan, and they were declassified by that time. And he made a copy and then had others made, and one of them eventually threw a fell across the street, ended up in my hands, and my God, it was, it would have probably cost us a million, a million casualties, they estimated, at least, and who knows how many dead, and they, they had every conceivable defense of that island that could be planned for, planned for. Many submarines, scuba divers uh, with, that would carry limpet bombs and so on. And Boy, that would have been terrible. And, and they, by that time, of course, we, we had, we, we'd used the atomic bomb before these, or had we? No, we hadn't. We hadn't. <coughs> used the atomic bomb when these plans were drawn up, so they envisioned just straight infantry fighting because, of course, nobody knew about the atomic bombs. Mm -hmm. And they, they estimated in their battle plan that when it was over, assuming we were successful, Japanese culture would have ceased to exist because the whole island would have just been totally devastated. Um, okay, now, you, and you got the Distinguished Service Cross for what happened on Dulles Bay. Yeah. Okay. Now, after you got out of the Army, what did you do? I, I went back to school in Boulder because I, I graduated, but I wanted to get a teaching certificate because at that time I thought I wanted to teach on the lower levels and I had to get a certificate first, which I, which I did in a desultory fashion, I must admit enjoying being in Boulder. What was it like, or how was the CU different after the war than it was before the war? Well, of course, uh, there were hundreds, if not, yeah, hundreds of uh, veterans that were going to school on the GI Bill. And a lot of us, we still had uniforms, you know, khakis and, and pinks and the green shirts and all that sort of thing that we had. In our, so everywhere you went, you saw people, veterans, uh, togged out and part of their stuff that they'd had in the Army. You actually received the DSC at uh, CU? Yeah. What was That's, that like? Well, uh, Walt Franklin, who was a, a captain, and it was a, fa a faculty member in the business school, had been let out by that time, and I got this notification that I could be awarded the, the DSC at a place of my choosing, and so I said, well, I think right here in Boulder, in the, the uh, Boulder Theater, and 
Captain uh, Walt Franklin organized a, a color guard and he was in his uniform and I was in mine and we went went over there and there but my notified my parents and there were other spectators there and he gave me the distinguished service cross and so your parents didn't make it for that yeah okay good um, Okay, and then you went on to teach at the college level, was that? Well, first I, I taught at, at a high school in Alliance, Nebraska, and I didn't like teaching at that level at all because you had to be a disciplinarian, and I didn't, I had no taste for being a disciplinarian, so I eventually <coughs> went to graduate school and got my doctorate, and from then on I taught at the college level. And where did you get your doctorate? Uh, University of Maryland. Okay, now let's just talk about special, you know, kind of overall kinds of things. Um, do you think you were changed as a human being by the war? No, I don't think so. I was just extremely grateful to be alive and healthy, you know. The, the loss of one eye is no big deal. It's not be a lot worse to lose one arm or one leg and as long as nothing happens to the other eye you're basically as good as you ever were. Um, you said you were, and obviously you were very good at this, had you given any thought to doing it as a career or were you a citizen soldier? I was a citizen soldier because primarily in the military you're going to have commanding officers that you don't like or don't like you and that it works both ways and the idea of periodically running up against somebody like Colonel Woolley who would despise me on sight and for whom I would have nothing but contempt said I wasn't suited for the peacetime army. Tom Brokaw describes you all as the greatest generation. Do you agree with that statement? Well we were yeah, we were the luckiest generation because we all grew up in the Depression and believe it or not, we all look back on that as a wonderful training ground, a wonderful experience. Of course, we were, we were kids then, so it didn't bother us, but our poor parents must have suffered the agonies of the damned. And then to go into, from the Depression, into war and to emerge victorious in the war, well, that was heaven on earth, you know, and those of us that were more or less hale and hearty, we had that doubly, that thing to be doubly grateful for. So, no, I don't, I don't have any nightmares or anything. The only I don't regret being wounded or any of that. I, I regret all of our people, many of whom I knew who were killed, of course, and Sergeant McDermott particularly, because he and I were very close, even though he was an enlisted man and I was an officer. But, you know, people like Carl Caracas and Bruce Coggins, with whom I was really friendly, came through okay, and we get together periodically. So. My only re regret, other than the dead, were, were having to kill those Germans. I, I still, I can see that as clearly as though it happened yesterday. Perhaps you could comment on a few of the people who were actually killed. Well, this, this is a roster of all of the dead in the 10th Mountain Division Foundation. It's a roster in the, the foundation put together. I'm trying to find the right sequence of sheets there. You know, there's so many dead that I've checked off here, but from our company and others. But basically, most of the men in a company. I don't think any given officer knows. You know the men in your platoon and your sergeants and so on, but you don't have time, you know, to get to know the rest of them. But one here, Terry Cullen, 
he was about oh six six or so, and he had big feet. And at one point at Camp Hale, my boots had worn out, but they didn't have any at that time 13s in stock, and so I had I asked him if I could borrow a pair of his shoes, which which he loaned me, and I wore until I got got them back. But he was outstanding because he was so tall for no other reason and a you know, real nice kid. That first night on Gorgolesco, he was in a squad. Basically the whole squad was caught in a burst of machine gun fire and it laid, I don't know, eight or nine of them down dead and some that had been, had survived the first burst were on the ground and apparently had raised their heads up because one Sergeant Savage, who was the squad leader, had the top of his head missing and he'd fallen then, his brain had fallen out in the dust. I, that, that was one of those sights you see that you never forget. And his brother was in another company, but they got word to him and he came over shortly thereafter and collected Savage's ring and watch and so forth and so on. I thought, what a shock it must have been. But anyway, Terry Cullen and Savage, I'll never forget them. And here, an officer here, Les McDermott, I got to be quite friendly with him as I, I rode around in various places. He had a car with him and he uh, had a, a beautiful wife and, a, and two lovely twins, and he was killed that first night on Mount Gorgolesco. And Larry McKenzie, he was another one that I was very well aware of. And here's one, Ed Johnson. He joined us just before the, a day or two before the attack on Gorgolesco. And Carl Caracas and I were talking that evening after he joined us and talk, I don't know what made us think that, but w both of us at the same time came to the conclusion that he wasn't going to survive. Now, why we thought that, I don't know, but he was a big, good looking fella, you know, had the same good training that we did. Well, that first night on Gorgolesco, he'd apparently, he was lying down on the hill like we all were, and apparently real grazing fire had just stitched him down one side. He, he was still alive, but on the other side, where his ammunition belt was, there were two or three machine gun rounds poking through the fabric on the belt. They'd gone completely through him, of course, all that soft tissue and lodged in the bed. He was, he was green, I remember that, but he was still alive. And we wrapped him up and the best we could and sent him back to the aid station. But I guess he lingered for a few days and then he died. But you really remember those people. Robert St. Louis, he was the officer that took over command of B Company from me after Gorgolesco. I was only the company commander, I don't know, three or four days, and they sent uh, Robert St. Louis over. I think basically because Colonel Woolley didn't have any confidence in me, he hadn't found out what a hell of a warrior I was going to turn out to be. But anyway, that's the... Okay, now you've mentioned before the fact that you guys trained together for two years. Yeah. And that formed a tremendous bond, oh, I presume. Oh, yeah. You know, you, you, you get so that you, you love your platoon, you love your company, and you're convinced that your battalion and your regiment are the best that there are, which I still think. In fact, uh, B Company, one of the generals of the, of the division brought a, apparently a British general around inspecting and he 
he introduced them. He said, B Company is my best company in my best battalion. So we, we were a good outfit. Um, my experience with this is really strictly to uh, what I've read, but I understand people have made the statement that the reason that men fight in battles is for their comrades, not for a greater purpose. Can you comment on well, that? Well, the idea of, of patriotism, yeah, it, it's there, but it's not there. But once you get into battle, it's your men. You're looking out for them, and they're looking out for you, and they're looking out for each other. And that's, yeah, that's, that's where your entire focus is. Okay. Um, you, is that a bronze star that you have up there too? Yeah. Where did you get that? I got that, I suppose, for that combat patrol, but I, I'm not sure. Because, you know, a lot of people can't understand this, but d during the war, the orders would come out, somebody would be awarded a, a decoration, the chances are he didn't get the decoration and probably not a copy of the citation. In, in the hospital, I, I, don't, I think this was in the uh, hospital after the, the MASH hospital. They came around and they just handed us purple hearts. You know, everybody who was wounded got a purple heart. I never did get an, an official thing about the Purple Heart, even though I was awarded two of them, one for the first set of wounds and the second one for the wounds the next morning. Okay. And then you have some awards from other countries? Yeah. And I, my thought is that the, the Polish government in exile and the Italian government in exile, because what I have is a Polish cross of valor and the Italian cross of military valor. I think they went through the American lists and everybody that had won a Congressional Medal or a Distinguished Service Cross, they, they gave us these. Uh, why do you think the Polish government would have? Well, these were governments in exile and they, they were probably uh, currying favor really with, with the, the American army and so on. The, 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 the Italian might have had something to do with the fact that we did some work with partisans and whether that had anything to do with it or not, I don't know. Charles Schultz, the creator of Peanuts, yeah. said his most significant accomplishment in his whole life and the thing he was most proud of was his combat infantry badge. Yeah, yeah. We all, as after our first battle, they came around and everybody got a combat infantry badge and we all were really proud of that badge because that meant we'd been under fire. The troops had been blooded and we were alive and exulting in the fact that we were alive. <laughs> but in, in connection with, with war and your comrades and so on, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. who fought extensively in the Civil War and was seriously wounded and invalided out, was a Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Court. And he was giving a speech to, I think it was the Sussex Bar Association. And one of the quotations that I've seen that is with me to this day, he said, in our youth, we had the extreme good fortune that our hearts were touched with fire. And I think he meant the fire of the battlefield and the fire of patriotism too, because you know the Civil War and those, the people that went in at first, they were inflamed with patriotism. But that thing, it was our extreme good fortune that our hearts were touched with fire. And so that's, there, there he was, you know, a successful jurist, 30 years, 20 years, whatever it was after the Civil War, and to him that was, that was the memory. In fact, I, I, I read other things about him. He said that the, that the Civil War and, and what happened and so on, those were the high points of his life. And I think most soldiers, I'd be willing to bet, regard that 
the service in combat in the military as probably the high point of their lives for, for whatever makes them a man. I feel that way. I, there's never been anything else in my life that compares to my service in, in the war and particularly combat in Italy. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Right. I'd li just like to add that my, those are my memories, but everybody else who was in the same company, the same situation, would have a slightly different take on it. So, you know, anybody that says, well, there are inconsistencies <laughs> with uh, what he says with what somebody else said, it's not an attempt to lie, it's just those are my memories and Carl Caracas has a slightly different take on it and Bruce Coggins a slightly different take. Bruce Coggins, by the way, uh, stayed in the reserve and got his law degree and was called back to service for Korea and stayed in after that and eventually became a a brigadier general in the judge advocate general's office and retired as a brigadier general. And Carl? Carl got out like I did and didn't stay in the reserves and he he had various jobs, none of which he liked very well as most of us went through that. And he eventually got a job with uh, General Motors and ended up as uh, a negotiator with the unions on the side of General Motors, and he loved that. Anything else? Can't think of anything. Thank you very much. My pleasure. On April the 8th, 2015, the Cray Training Support Center building was dedicated in John's memory at Fort Drum, New York, the home of the 10th Mountain Division.